Hi. So we're going to start. Um, we're convening this meeting of the New York State Commission on Forensic Science. Commissioner and Chairperson O'Donnell will be here shortly, but as Acting Director of the Office of Forensic Services, I'll convene the meeting. Um, we'd like to welcome you all here today and thank you for coming. If we can just take note that we have a lot of material to cover today, so we'll try to keep to the schedule. I know a few people have to leave at 4.30, so we'll do the best we can to keep things moving along. If we can um, review and approve the meeting agenda, I can have a motion to do so. Any Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. And uh, your binder contains the meeting minutes from the December 11th commission meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, uh, I just want to sure. find the minutes so, very, very briefly. There was something that I had said uh, <coughs> regarding notification. I apologize. Uh, yeah, on the bottom of page three it says, uh, Inspector General notifies all the district attorneys and the, the district attorneys then notify the prosecutor that it should be then notified of the defense attorney. Can I have a motion to accept as amendment as amended? <coughs> a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, we'll first move to lab updates and accreditation issues. Our first item is the Westchester County Department of Labs, and this is an information only, no vote. Kathy, do you wanna this is uh, the Westchester County Department of Labs and Research? Division of Forensic Sciences is uh, ASCLAD Lab International Accredited Laboratory. And they are, this is their surveillance audit. They have one every year. Inspectors come in and they actually do a quick, uh, short inspection. This has been voted on by the ASCLAD Lab Board. That uh, update of that letter is also in your, we handed out at this meeting in that packet of materials. It's a March 22nd letter. <coughs> And that day were voted on on February 12th by the ASCLAD Lab Board of Directors. That's a requirement of the ASCLAD Lab International Program. There were no issues with the inspection or the surveillance assessment, I should say. But if you have, do have any questions regarding that, we do have the Lab Director, Bob O'Donnell, here to answer those. <coughs> so this is informational only, no vote is necessary. Commissioner O'Donnell has arrived. Hello. The next item on the agenda is the Nassau County Police Department Forensic Evidence Bureau, and this is their request for accreditation and question documents. Yes, they have had a. They were on provisional accreditation uh, at a previous <laughs> meeting, and they have had an inspection by ASCLAD Lab on February 4th and 5th of this year, and that inspection report is included in the commission materials. And they have um, also been voted on by the ASCAD Lab Board in the discipline of question documents. This will be in addition to their existing um, accreditation, <coughs> so we need to vote on that for the new state accreditation to add question documents that will be um, continuous to their expiration of their of their ASCLAD lab uh, inspection date, which is February 6, 2013. We need a motion to. And we do have the lab director, Jim Brunell, is here. <coughs> Any questions regarding that? It's, <clears throat> it's really not related to the credentials, but it, it, it's, it, the overall tone of the report suggests that the facility is being strained uh, by its own. Uh, lack of hospitality. Uh, there's a note that there are several areas that, that don't have a fire detection system. Is that literally true? I mean... Um, uh, Jim I Brunel, you need to come to the front table. Uh, 
Yes, sir, there are areas in the building where we're uh, located in the police headquarters in Nassau County. And so and the police office. headquarters couldn't get a building permit and a CFO if, if it was looked into is what you're saying, right? I, I'm not exactly sure what they had to go right. through, but... So uh, we would certainly there recommend... Is, there is, a, there is uh, one or two rooms that don't have a system, yes. All right, well, I recommend first alert... Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, do something. I mean, I'm we, just, uh, just, just from the, from just expressing. Me, we're, we're trying. All right, just <laughs> expressing my concern on behalf of your staff. That's all. Are there any other questions? No. I'll make a motion. Yep. Is there a second? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <coughs> Accreditation is granted. Okay. The next item is the Erie County Department of Central Police Services, the ASPAD Lab Legacy Report of Inspection that was performed on June 22nd. There's a DNA subcommittee binding recommendation letter. Is there any discussion? Legacy inspection for a period of five years. We're gonna we have a number of issues after this that we're gonna to pick up in the second session. Um, but this one relates to the legacy inspection, and we do have a binding recommendation from the DNA subcommittee. So unless you want to wait until after we take up the other issues, I think we should. Yes. The mixture interpretations that will be discussed later. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think we should wait unless you have a problem, unless you don't want to vote on accreditation until we discuss the other issues. Yeah. You'd rather wait. Yeah. Okay. All right. So do we have a motion? Okay. So at this point in time, uh, we are going to um, need a motion to go into executive session. We do have a number of issues um, that re relate to personal <coughs> matters um, involving particular individuals um, that are subject to um, an executive session of the. Uh, of the commission. So could I have a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Any opposition? Okay. Thank you. So we are gonna have to ask uh, mm -hmm. to leave. to approve 
um, the accreditation for the Erie County Lab. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor of accreditation, uh, please say aye. Aye. Any opposition? Okay, that motion is carried um, for um, accreditation at the Erie County Department of Central Police Services. We're now going to old business. Um, the first matter um, on the agenda for old business is a uh, matter that came up previously at the time of um, accreditation, I believe, um, regarding the Niagara County Sheriff's Lab. Um, there was a request um, that the lab director uh, be here. And uh, Frank, are you here? Yes. Okay, good to see you. Um, and there were um, <coughs> several questions that came up about a finding in the ESLA lab reports that um, uh, members of the commission wanted to ask about. So I'll turn it over. Was that you, Barry? And uh, <coughs> if you recall, I think it was a matter regarding proficiency testing in the lab report. Or it might have been Dr. Jenny. I don't recall. I don't recall. <laughs> I don't recall who raised it. But um, do we have the report in here, too? The report is in, is in the packet. In the packet, okay. But I think there were a couple matters um, in the report that, that several commission members asked about. And if there are any questions, or if you want to take a few minutes to look at that, I can go on and we can come back to it. Um, since we did have the lab director make the trip. I, I suggested uh, if any of the questions had to do with line proficiency testing that the, uh, the next item on the agenda be combined. Sure. That probably makes a lot of sense. Okay. Uh, why don't you stay with us? I okay. Some recollection. Yeah. Um, didn't you do some line proficiency testing with fingerprints? We don't do fingerprints at all. Uh, can you all keep your voices up? <clears throat> I haven't mixed up. Sorry. Okay. All right. Um, so we, if you would stay with us, but you can get uh, off the uh, hot seat here. <laughs> and, uh, we, um, the next item, because I, I think the Niagara County lab issue did relate to line proficiency testing. And I know um, Kathy Corrado um, has been um, looking at um, this issue on behalf of NICLEC. And uh, Kathy agreed to get on the agenda Hi, how are you? and to uh, make a report to us on um, the efforts that have been underway at NICLEC. So I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Corrado. Thank you. Um, as, as Commissioner O'Donnell just said, the lab directors were tasked with looking at some additional measures as part of our quality assurance system. And specifically, we were asked to look at blind proficiency testing as well as random reanalysis programs to check individual analyst work in the laboratory. Um, we spent some time looking at the blind proficiency testing, and we actually prepared a document which I believe you've all been given um, titled The Analysis of the Feasibility of Blind Proficiency Testing. Um, it's the consensus of the laboratory directors that blind proficiency testing is really not practical or feasible for us given the different types of labs that we have, the different organizations we're part of, and the different types of disciplines that we do in the lab. Um, instead, we think that the random reanalysis would be just an effect, as effective of a mechanism <laughs> to reanalyze, to look at analyst work, and it would address the same issues that the blind proficiency testing will address. Um, we also believe the random reanalysis will serve as a deterrent uh, against intentional misconduct by analysts. And we have proposed the second document that we provided is um, the recommendations for a laboratory reanalysis program. These are recommendations and guidelines that the NICLEC group put together that we've handed out to all the labs for the labs to establish random reanalysis programs in their laboratories. Um, we put a lot of thought into some of the issues that would come up with that, and we believe we have some good guidelines in place. And um, our recommendation is that the laboratories within the state will implement a random reanalysis program in 2009, so all the laboratories will do that. And at the beginning of 2010, 
when NIFLAC reconvenes, we'll meet, we'll bring all the data that we have from that reanalysis program, look at what worked, look at what didn't work, look for improvements. Then we will um, summarize that data and report back to the commission as to how that worked. So the goal is for us all to be performing a random reanalysis in 2009. Um, having said that, there are a few labs that do a limited amount of blind proficiency testing. Um, the NYPD does a small amount. Well, that's a little easier for me not to shout. Uh, the NYPD does a small amount of blind proficiency testing in the drug section, and they may continue to do that on a limited basis. However, they, they said they're scaling back on that, and they believe that the uh, random reanalysis will be an effective means to do that as well. That's um, I yeah, is that you. recommendation in all disciplines or some disciplines or what is it really for change? What we're recommending right now is that a laboratory has, in 2009, should attempt to implement this in at least 50% of the disciplines that they perform. That is the recommendation of ASCLAD lab as well. And um, there's some disciplines where it might not be possible or at least given the what we're proposing right now, it might not be possible. So. We're asking that labs implement it in at least 50% of the disciplines. So if the uh, ASCLAB lab requirement, or that's not, it's not a requirement, but it's a suggestion, the laboratory, I'm just quoting here, the laboratory should conduct annual proficiency testing in each discipline using re-examination or blind techniques. And I think most of these that we see, uh, the, the, it's usually checked no. Would this mean that that would now be checked yes? Re-examination would be the same as reanalysis. I believe as long as you're doing it in 50 percent of your disciplines, yes. But the re-examination, you know, reading your report, it looked like the re-examination was going to be done within the lab by the same people that did the tests. Not by the same people that did the test, by a different analyst that wasn't involved in the original test. And we would we would test we would test all of your analysts but it would be done, a different person would test a different analyst's work. Well, would, uh, would that meet the ASCLAD guidelines? Yes, I believe yes. it would. Would that meet the ISO guidelines? ISO doesn't speak to blind proficiency testing. I'm talking about the examination. <coughs> or, or, I'm sorry, the examination, I don't believe. Uh, uh, is there any, did you guys discuss at all the possibility of uh, uh, the examination of one laboratory's work being done by the other? Another laboratory? <coughs> we, we did discuss that, and, and we believe there's a lot of issues related to that that would be difficult to work out. So we think for now the best thing to do would be for us to get the policies set up for doing it in our own lab, see what the issues are, and we can maybe look at those kind of things in the future. But I think our feeling is there's a lot of issues with evidence transport and testifying in different jurisdictions and things like that that might cause an issue with that. Kathy, could you run through? Briefly, what the procedures are for the people that haven't had the benefit of going through the report. Sure, um, and again, the the these are just recommendations for um, what, what a lab should think about to implement the program. We're not telling labs how they have to exactly do it. This is just saying you know what you need to think about to put this this policy in place. Um, the first one is that. The, we're suggesting that the laboratory should be performing reanalysis in at least 50% of the disciplines that it's accredited in, which is what we've already discussed. Um, we're also saying that the frequency of how often the reanalysis is performed should be determined by each individual laboratory because there are so many factors that go into that, depending on the size of the lab, the number of analysts they have, the number of cases that they do, and of course there are other resources. So we're saying the lab will have to determine that. Um, going towards what Mr. Sheff just asked about, we're suggesting that the reanalysis should be performed by the same laboratory, so within the same laboratory that did the initial analysis. Um, we're also suggesting it's very important that the cases that are chosen for reanalysis, while they, they should be random in that the people that are, the, the first analyst that's doing the work will not know which case would ever be chosen. So in that sense, it's random. However, someone, the supervisor or someone above, has to decide which cases should be chosen because there's issues that have to be dealt with in terms of consumption of sample. We want to make sure that you're not going to choose a case where reanalysis would consume a sample such that there wouldn't be enough for the defense. And there's issues where if there's a court date or something coming up that 
you want to make sure that the reanalysis was done in a sufficient amount of time. So there has to be someone above that's looking at which cases are chosen to make sure that these things are taken into account. I'm confused. You're anticipating reanalysis on ongoing cases as opposed to closed cases? Yes. We're suggesting that the reanalysis be done up front. Would any of these considerations change if you were doing reanalysis on closed cases? Well, I think the concern that we have is we would like the reanalysis to be done very close in time to the initial reanalysis. In some disciplines, you know, you would have, say in an arson case or something like that, you might have samples that lose over time, things like that. So we want to make sure that the analysis is done as close in time to the first analysis as possible. We're also suggesting that the reanalysis should occur prior to the first report being released so that if there are issues, that they could be resolved before a report goes out. And if there's some kind of issue, that it happens before the report goes out so that it doesn't affect the client doesn't receive a report that might have misinformation in it. And also there's issues with making sure that we can get the evidence back. So that's another reason to do it up front is that we won't have to worry about calling the evidence back. The evidence might not have been destroyed and things like that. The sixth item recommendation is that the, we would say that the reanalysis should not be blind to the second examiner in the sense of it's actually testing the first examiner's results because they don't know what case will be chosen for reexamination or not. But the second examiner, they can't help but know that they're reanalyzing someone's case because let's say you have clothing where there was a cutting taken out of a, you know, a blood stain off a piece of clothing. They're going to see the hole in the clothing and they're going to know what was there. And so that's important because if you want to reanalyze, you want to reanalyze similar stains, similar things like that. In addition, they're also going to be looking for things that somebody might have missed. So obviously they're going to look at the evidence up front, but they need to understand if there were sampling that was taken, where those samples were taken from. If it's a large drug case, they would need to understand which samples were used in there, making sure that they're taking similar samples. The seventh issue, or recommendation rather, is that all of the reanalysis, all of the work that is done by the second person will be part of the case file, part of the case record. It's important that all that information is present so that anybody that gets that file downstream will have all that information. And lastly, we would like for the quality assurance manager in the lab will have to actually be sort of the overseer of the entire system so that we know which cases were reanalyzed, which analysts had the cases reanalyzed, what the results were, so we can compile all the data. So we're just asking that a person has something up front so they know exactly how it's going to work so that we make sure that everybody's covered and everything is done and accounted for. The other thing that I think I forgot to mention was that it's very important, it's under number five, is that there has to be a policy in place prior to the start of doing the reanalysis. There should be a policy in place that discusses what you will do if you get discrepant results, how they will be handled, and also if you get not necessarily results that are discrepant but just slightly different, which results will be reported. So there should be something up front that you have a policy, and depending on the discipline, that policy might be different. So in a drug case, if you get a slightly different weight, which one is going to be reported? You should know up front whether it's the first one or you're going to choose the lower one or however the policy works out. But that should be decided prior to any issues coming up so you know what your policy is before the issue occurs. I would think both should be reported out. You get two different results in a drug case and just one is reported to the DA and the defense counsel and not the other? Well, they'll all be in the file, so they'll all be turned over. Who gets the file as opposed to the report? It talks about reporting out. I read the reporting out to mean the lab is going to determine which report will be made public, so to speak. I think one of the problems is that specifically in a drug case, there is going to be, if there's only one bag in there, there is going to be a reduction in weight when it's reanalyzed because the first analyst did use some. So in that particular case, it would probably, unless there's a huge discrepancy that 
is a red flag, I would think the first one would have to be reported out because that's the original weight of the sample on, as received in the laboratory. But why, why not Harvey the second one as well? I mean, the reader can see that the, the difference in weight is due to testing. I don't know if that's an issue for the, uh, uh, on the legal side for the prosecution or defense on, with two weights showing up there. I, yeah. I, don't know. I would think that you would need to set some parameters of what weight needs to be tested, and if the second result is exceeds those parameters, then that would be something that would need to be reported. Obviously, you're going to have a lower weight in second, yeah, second sure. test. So why, 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 the, why the reluctance to put well, both reports out? Yeah, but number eight says quality assurance managers should be responsible for retaining all documentation and records. So... You know, I have a problem. When you read these things uh, singly and, and as opposed to together, it seems to be two different results uh, often achieved. Well, uh, I mean, I don't think, I, I mean, it seems to me that all of, since all the documentation was supposed to be carried forward, there is the two reports, so-called two reports or two findings. Yet yeah. when, when you look at this, what's reported out, if you're predetermining which one gets reported out, mm -hmm. then you're not really doing that. I mean, I, I, mean, I think... Uh, that there's a number of issues here which uh, seem to have been addressed to make each of these individual items seem uh, less controversial, let's call it. Uh, but yet, if you read it together, there seems to be a different result. I, mean, I don't know that there would be any, it certainly would be highly understandable that if you're consuming product, the weight's going to change. And if that's set forth in the documentation, it's, it is what it is. I mean, it's unassailable. So why, right, why, why not withhold it? Why withhold it? I, 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 want a, I want a lab report that says to me as a prosecutor, you have one ounce of cocaine here. The quality assurance that's done later measured 0.95 ounces of cocaine. That's of no relevance to me, but the documentation of that is still going to be in the lab, and I would suspect that it eventually is going to be disclosed to both sides. I don't suspect that well, at all, because the 99% of these cases are pled out. Um, I, I just, in other words, I think that this is, you know, a, a good, a great step forward, and I think that there are certain inconsistencies here which need not be here. Um, I mean, I think that the <coughs> notion of, of straining to do current cases which are not closed uh, because you're worried about an arson case affects the arson cases and doesn't affect the drug cases, for example. Um, uh, again, uh, you know, when you're when you're trying to bring forth reform, it's probably smart to do it in the least controversial way, and maybe this is what we have here, and we'll move on later on. But I think that some of the objections to the discrete proposals are based on the fact that it is too, uh, if you will, cautious uh, at certain points, uh, and, the, and the concern to eliminate all problems just really winds up creating other problems in certain areas. Um, just my overall reaction. Well, I think this is helpful feedback that Mike Black and Ted Back and also the himself get legal advice because this is really a legal issue. Just in terms one of the I, I would hope I would hope you would not consider uh, doing reanalysis on violations and class B misdemeanors and class A misdemeanors. <laughs> 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 No, I think, I mean, the issue is if, if the, uh, the majority of what we're going to get are uh, hopefully, obviously, consistent results, and I think that's not the issue. If, if you get discrepant results, that's something that has to be resolved. And I think what Mr. Fitzpatrick said is right. I mean, depending on what that difference is, that's an issue. So I, I think that's something that, that's why we're rolling this out, and that's why we're going to put it into play and see what are the issues that come up. and address them appropriately. Yeah, let's change it let's change it to a fingerprint. Analyst A says I, I it's not your suspect. Analyst B, the reanalysis says it is. And then analyst A, who may be less experienced or may not be, but looks at it and says, You're right, there's a mistake. All of that information's got to be made available to me and certainly to the yeah, defense lawyer right, as well. Sure. I think they would not yes. would agree yeah, with that. Yeah, right. sure. Yeah. Could you give any thought uh, in terms of blind proficiency testing uh, to doing some disciplines that might be easier to accomplish, like fingerprints, 
of ballistics. We thought a lot about the blind proficiency testing, and you know, when when you're an agency that's that's not associated with the police department, and you talk about things like fingerprints, where you have to create a scenario where something may or may not be there. We do not. The lab directors do not believe that that's practical or feasible. That is really our belief. Have you ever tried it? We have tried. In our laboratory, in the past, we would create internal things that way, and we have run into problems with that. That's why we go to the external proficiency test. I mean, has anybody in NICLAC ever tried a blind proficiency test? Can you document for us what problems are there? Of let's say easy things, and I mean easy in the sense of creating samples like fingerprints or uh, tool marks on bullets, cartridges. I, I can give an example in our laboratory years ago when we someone uh, tried to create an internal, and that was just it. If you if you take two guns and you know they're two separate, and you shoot them, and you think the result's going to be that they is clearly an exclusion, yet when a firearms examiner looks at it, they might say it's inconclusive because they actually were closer. Unless you had a firearms examiner examine those bullets up front, so you had a referee person that reviews all that, you don't really know what the right result is. That that's the point is when you order proficiency tests from proficiency test providers, they know what the right results are and they have referee people that check that. So those are some of the issues that are, they sound, maybe to you they sound simple up front, but <coughs> in a practicality purpose they're not that simple. Uh, and now with respect to the, the first recommendation, uh, you're, you're basically dubbed, you know, matching up with what uh, ASCLAD Lab looks at to get a positive answer on one of their important criteria, which is 50%. Is there any notion that, that the 50 percent will change during the course of over, over a period of years? In other words, not, so that uh, the same, if you have 100 disciplines, the same 50 disciplines aren't the ones being subject to reanalysis year in and year out, whereas the other 50 get a, get a buy? I'm concerned that this is way too low a floor. Well, I, I would say that I don't think the labs are, I don't think every lab saying I'm only going to meet 50 percent. I think the labs are going to try to meet it in as many disciplines as they can, mm -hmm. and we'll always strive to improve that. Um, our goal is not to say, let's do the minimum. Our goal is to do the best that we can do. Okay. So, you know, that's something you can, um, as, as Commissioner O'Donnell said, when we report back and summarize, these are our results. If that's something that we need to address, we can address that. If there's something we, that so one lab is doing and another lab isn't, we can say, oh, this is how we did it. Maybe now you can try it, too. All right. All right. I mean, I would just like to see that documented which, which uh, disciplines are being subjected to reanalysis and which disciplines are not as part of the reporting. I think we didn't discuss this in deliberately because it was going to come up and it, it, with the individual reports that came forth today, there were three or four in which there was no documentation of reanalysis or blind analysis uh, on that aspect of the ASCLAD lab report. Uh, I think it's great that we'll be getting some of that, but I think that uh, additional documentation should be considered is what I'm saying. So that we know which disciplines are being tested, which disciplines are not, and whether or not that's happening year after year after year, so that certain guys in the lab know that they're getting a buy and others don't. Or, or instead of year after year staggered, mm -hmm. this, this year it's fingerprints, next year it's tool marks. I, I yeah, without telling them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I have to say that uh, I'm extremely disappointed uh, at this report. And I, I think it, uh, it leaves a lot to be desired. First, with respect to the blind proficiency tests. If you keep on citing the 2003 <coughs> study uh, that uh, Jason and Gansland did uh, pursuant to the DNA identification, <coughs> and as I told you in many meetings, I was on that group. Uh, and to start looking at, and we did succeed in doing proficiency tests, but they were on complicated things like uh, what we specifically did was take uh, blood on genes that could have perpetrator blood and uh, 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 victim blood and then gave them to the various different labs. And admittedly, that has its complications because uh, of the nature of the samples. But what I specifically said to you people uh, uh, from the beginning is that you should not have those same difficulties with fingerprints and with tool marks on bullets. And I specifically mentioned to you on more than one occasion that those were the disciplines that are currently being looked at because of the problems of observer bias and subjective analysis and the failure to come up with objective standards and data on frequencies and reporting things out correctly. These are all the findings now in the NAS report 
that severely attack these things. And I absolutely don't believe that you could not have at least tried to do interlaboratory blind proficiency tests with fingerprints or tool marks. What you basically did is said, we can't do this at all. We think it's too complicated. We can't do it. Now, that is just wrong. When we first formed this commission, Paul Sheckman, uh, who was the first uh, uh, DCJS, I guess, coordinator, he went out and we did a proficiency test with absolutely nothing uh, in a rape case, a single perpetrator rape case on DNA. So I really think that uh, uh, this uh, it shows me nothing. Uh, to just cite a 2003 report that had nothing to do with the easier disciplines and that uh, all of you feel that you can't do any kind of a blind test, even between laboratories, on fingerprints or, or, or tool marks on bullets, uh, I, is just not plausible to me. And with respect to the reanalysis, uh, and I think we went through this uh, uh, this issue has arisen, but I can't uh, 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 before. Uh, for example, if you're going to even be determining mixtures, right, in a DNA samples, why can't the second reader uh, do it as a blind analysis without knowing uh, all the different sources? Uh, why can't that be done uh, uh, within a laboratory? Why? That's a, I'm sorry to interrupt no. you, but that's a different issue. I mean, we're talking about blind proficiency testing, reanalysis, that's blind verification, those are all different issues. And, and we believe that the reanalysis will address the same issues that a blind proficiency test would address. And that's what we're looking at well, here. I and mean, that's a separate issue if you want to talk let me, about Let that. me move to that, because the same report uh, that talked about the blind proficiency tests, uh, the conclusion was reanalysis. And uh, that committee wasn't thinking of reanalysis mm -hmm. by the same people within the same laboratories. They were thinking about reanalysis of one laboratory to another, uh, specifically, and, and so you wouldn't know, and, and also making it blind, so you wouldn't know what the results were. And they weren't necessarily supposed to be on ongoing cases, or closed cases. What you're describing to me as your so-called reanalysis is just quality assurance within a laboratory. Somebody looking at it, for example, in a fingerprint case or ballistic case, that just means that somebody else is looking at the same Hopefully now we'll get photomicrographs of the uh, striations on the bullets or on the cartridges uh, or you know, looking at the ridges and the fingerprints again. Uh, that, that has nothing to do with using up sample. Those are fixed things that are not going to be used up by a reanalysis. And that's the kind of thing that should be going on anyhow in a laboratory with respect to quality assurance. That's not what we were talking about in terms of reanalysis. The whole idea is to make this blind. The whole idea is to have somebody outside of the laboratory take a look at this. Uh, this, this is not a good substitute. This shows very, very little effort on the part of NICLAD. I mean, I, I'm really sorry. I don't mean to be obnoxious like this, but uh, uh, this issue has been going on for years and years and years and years. And I don't really think that uh, all of you made a serious effort to come to terms with it. Okay. I, 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 I couldn't disagree with you more. I, I, I think that, uh, that knowing the people involved, I think they, uh, you have a allegiance to blind proficiency testing. Absolutely. And uh, I, I don't think you've made your case to me that it's superior to the point where we have to subject every crime laboratory in the state of New York to, to creating fictitious, I mean, you have to create a completely fictitious case. Otherwise, it's going to be a joke. It's going to go, oh, here's another one of the blind proficiency tests that uh, you know, looks fake and is fake and we know it's fake. And that, you know, that, that'd be great in a world where we had unlimited budgets and unlimited resources and the superintendent didn't have you know, 50 rapes to investigate every day and I didn't have 25 homicides every year. To, that, that, would be, that would be an ideal world. But I think that, you know, I, I, I understand your disagreement philosophically with it, but I don't think you need to suggest that NICLAD just you know, sat around in a room for... 30 seconds and, you know, came up with this idea. I don't think that's appropriate. Look, I'm, I'm not trying to cast dispersions personally, but this report shows no real effort. Well, I am. I am. Okay. Like, you're looking at me funny. I am in the sense that this report, you may very well have sat around and said, uh, hopefully address the question that I raised in the first place. Why can't you do it for fingerprints? Why can't you do it for tool marks on bullets? Why not that? Why not just a few proficient, blind proficiency tests on that? 
Nobody was suggesting that you necessarily had to do blind proficiency testing on every discipline within a laboratory. That's not what, frankly, was put out to you. What was put out to you uh, very, very directly, I can go back and look at other minutes, is that in these areas where we know that there's problems, demonstrable problems of observer bias, and real problems in terms of the underlying validation of how these comparisons are made, why couldn't you do just a few blind proficiency testing, even intralaboratory? And I don't think, uh, with all respect, Bill, with just those areas, and those are the reasons I propose them, that it would be that hard to create a mock case and you can even take fingerprints that are already within the CODIS system. So you wouldn't have to worry about putting them back in again. Uh, so okay, I, so I just, just want to hear so from some other commissioners, Dr. J. I can make a comment that, Barry, if the resource were available for blind proficiency testing, there's no <clears> question every laboratory would subscribe to it if it were a defensible uh, program. Uh, I agree wholeheartedly that's a real challenge in developing a blind proficiency testing program if it weren't to be done. Um, at the same time, this reanalysis, I wouldn't characterize it as proficiency testing. Kathy, I think you said it well, proficiency testing, external proficiency testing, the materials used are well characterized. Uh, and if there's a discrepant report from a laboratory, then there's a basis for charging that laboratory with a testing error. This reanalysis, it's really a competency assessment of personnel and processes. In fact, uh, this reanalysis may recreate testing errors. Okay, what was reported initially in error may again be through reanalysis reported in error because it's lab protocol. You know, um, so I see real value in the external proficiency testing. The challenge is who's going to design it, who's going to support it. In the interlaboratory sharing of materials, if there are discrepancies, then who's to be the referee? Uh, we all know that whenever there is an error in proficiency testing, that raises serious flags and alarms to this commission. All of a sudden, that laboratory's competencies, proficiency is called into question. And I think it's probable in interlaboratory exchange of materials that there may be, well, I don't want to say probable, but there may be discrepancies, some more serious than others. Who's the referee? So I think that's a, I think it's a national challenge. I mean, this report, I, I think it does speak to a need for a resource for blind proficiency testing. The question is, whose responsibility is it to, to develop it? I'm not arguing that this doesn't cost some money. <clears throat> I'm not even proposing, and never did, uh, some large battery of blind proficiency tests where I specifically asked NICLED to think about it, was in the field of fingerprints and tool mark identification, where we had already had problems that this committee has already looked at in various different laboratories in the state. Um, and we now know, uh, if you didn't before, that these are particular disciplines that where they're at, let's just call it, there's a lot of scientific dispute that you're going to hear about in courts having to do with the underlying validation and the problem of observer bias in these things. I just think that some modest effort could be made in this direction, but it may very well be. I'm beginning to reach the conclusion that uh, that will never happen uh, with the laboratory directors themselves uh, coming up with the standards for themselves. And because everything that you've all said, uh, uh, and what you just pointed out, Richard, is that you know if you do this, uh, and you get discrepancies, you're making big problems for yourself, and you, how you're going to work with it, you'll have to come back to this commission and explain everything. And so uh, it, it may very well be that we need somebody uh, from the outside that can come in and uh, uh, see if it's feasible uh, and make an effort to do a, a, just a feasibility blind proficiency testing completely on the outside. Uh, who comes in here and just does a few on uh, New York labs and just in the area of tool marks and bullets and proficiency testing. I'd make that suggestion just to see if that could work. And I, and I don't really, I, upon reflection, uh, 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 it really probably was too much to ask uh, uh, NICLAD to come up with some big program to do blind proficiency testing yourself. I suppose if I were in your position, I wouldn't propose it either. Uh, but that doesn't mean it shouldn't be done. Okay, but I think we 
we do know that we have national and international accreditation standards that have not moved in that direction, and they may. Um, I, I do think what we are talking about, maybe the <coughs> lack of proficiency testing, it may be the very best way that you can do it. Um, but we also know that we have labs who are facing um, pretty substantial cuts in their funding, not, not more money. So even costing a little more money when you have less money is a real challenge to the labs. So it, it, at least from my perspective, I appreciate your efforts in stepping up and dealing with this issue um, in a way that complies with the current accreditation standards. And I think um, that you know, this is an issue that we're going to be talking about in the future. If the science <laughs> develops, the technology develops, it's easier, cheaper, somebody can work out a way to be able to do this. Um, it may be something um, that we can move toward um, in the future, but I do think this is a step forward. So um, I, I do want to sort of um, counter the disappointment that Barry feels. Um, I think it's important that we have high standards in the labs. I think it's important that we do um, this kind of, of testing of our laboratory personnel, um, but uh, we have to be realistic in terms of uh, the economic climate that we're dealing with as well. So I appreciate your efforts in, in doing this. Um, I think we we'll want to continue to dialogue with you. I think we'll probably want to continue to push you in the direction of doing as much testing as you possibly can and seeing the results of that testing. And to the extent that there are more objective ways that you do it, I think it's critically important that you do that. Um, so we do have a busy agenda, and uh, we're going to move on. But I want to thank you, uh, <coughs> Dr. Bravo, and I want to thank NYCLEF uh, for taking on the challenge and uh, continuing to work on this issue with us. Um, we also have another issue uh, that NYCLEF has been working on. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry, Kathy. I see that you have another agenda item with respect to your lab. you want to report on that? Um, and this is just a, a brief update. I know the agenda is really busy. Um, we were asked to report back on our evidence tracking system that Onondaga County is putting in place. And I would say up front that other jurisdictions throughout the state obviously have evidence tracking systems, um, the laboratories and the police departments. And there's a lot of interaction between those at times. But I think what's different in Onondaga <laughs> County is that what we're trying to do is have a single evidence database. So all 20 police departments, as well as the laboratory, the medical examiner's office, and the district attorney's office are all going to be using a single evidence tracking system where any evidence that's collected by any of those agencies will go into this database, and every person that's involved in that will have access to see what evidence is there so the lab knows what's there to be tested, the DA knows what's available, what's not. Anybody can see where it is at any given time. So that's, that's the, how, what makes our system a little bit different than some of the others. Um, where we are in the process is that the contract was awarded to Porter Lee Company, which basically um, runs the FEAST evidence tracking system. Excuse me, what was the name of that? Porter Lee Porter Corporation. Lee. And a lot of labs in the state already use their uh, FEAST evidence tracking system for the laboratory. And a lot of PDs, police departments in the state, use their system as well. Um, the, the, Part of the system has been deployed in our largest police agencies, the Syracuse Police Department, the Onondaga County Sheriff's Department, and a smaller town and village department. So there's training databases in there. It's also been deployed in the medical examiner's office, and the lab already had it in place. Um, so we're trying that out. We've ordered the hardware, all the barcode scanners and printers and all that's been ordered. And basically, we're just now working out the business rules and the policies to put into place so we're all doing the same thing. And then we'll go to the testing phase over the summer. And we're hoping to have the system, if everything goes along track, we're hoping to have it uh, fully implement, implemented <coughs> in the fall of 2009. So that's basically where we're at on that. Uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, just a first yeah. to say that that is absolutely outstanding. That is exactly the model that should be followed all across the state. There are matters that this commission has uh, been discussing that we, I suppose, can't reveal openly, but if there was a tracking system whereby the evidence 
from the laboratories could be coordinated with each other and most importantly with the district attorney's office. Uh, there are some people that would have saved hundreds of hundreds of thousands of dollars on reanalysis. So this is, I, I didn't mean in the previous uh, section to be personal. This is a model, model for the state and a model for the country. Thank you. Question. Well, this attitude. applies only to, <laughs> <laughs> only to evidence that's submitted to your lab. No, this is all, all evidence, property and evidence that is collected within the county will all go into the, the single Whether database. it's destined for the lab or not. That's correct. Okay. And one other question, who determines when it's destroyed? Uh, sometimes by court order. Uh, homicide cases we keep forever. And other cases we usually keep. But that's, that's your, your policy. Right. Okay, but it, so, but it, it would vary from county to county. It could. It could, yeah, okay, that's it. I mean, that, that's something we yeah. probably will discuss later in the meeting. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I hope you'll come back and report to us as you get implemented because I think it's really uh, extremely helpful for us to follow what you're doing with this project. And thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and um, turning over to Harvey, who is also reporting on evidence um, collection this, this uh, discussions sort of, at night class. This sort of piggybacks on what Kathy's actually been talking about, too. Uh, essentially, what you have is a listing of all the laboratories and uh, how they are handling evidence. Now there's information missing from a couple laboratories who hadn't gotten it to me in time for, for this publication that will be added to it, so you will be getting an updated version of that uh, later on. Um, I didn't do a summary of it, I just put the information out as is. Uh, I didn't feel it was my place to summarize other laboratories' <coughs> information, but overall, essentially, the laboratories, uh, most of them do have the B system in their laboratories, which tracks the evidence within the laboratory. Uh, we have it in our largest uh, uh, customer, the Rockford Police Department. They have it in their evidence room and in their uh, uh, other areas, and a number of our agencies that we serve also have it, too. So. Um, it is being used to track evidence that way too. We are not able at this point, and had, probably it's just uh, not having the correct buttons pushed by Porter Lee, but we cannot do what Kathy can do, and that look at the evidence that the Rochester Police Department collected prior to submission to us. So, but I'm sure since it's the same system, that that can be incorporated into our system also. But this does show you what the different laboratories across the state, what their policies or procedures are in a limited uh, scope here um, as to where they get it from uh, and how it is stored in the laboratory and when it's returned or what's stored for longer or shorter periods within the laboratories. Um, what it does show you too is that the laboratory only have control of the evidence that's that they get submitted to them and, and then maintains their control over it and then they return it. Most laboratories are not repositories long term for evidence unless there's a few maybe that might take uh, uh, and have firearms evidence or maybe some drug storage for a longer period of time. All the laboratories do keep uh, in their freezers DNA cuttings and, and things like that for long term <laughs> storage. Uh, but we're not, we're not, we don't have the room or, or capabilities to be a repository for all the evidence that the agencies collect. Uh, and also, once they submit it, we can't keep it forever either. So it does go back in most instances to the submitting agency. Um, so, Harvey, is there any effort um, on the NICLAC to kind of examine that data and discuss best practices or? Um, uh, you know, uh, some kind of common interest in, in developing best practices for the labs? We haven't set forth anything at this point. Um, hearing what uh, Onondaga Laboratory is currently doing with linking everything together, I think would be something that each laboratory, after hearing that, would be interested in, in looking into also because that goes along with some of the reports that have come out as far as 
what happens to the evidence and, and who's responsible for it and everything like that. I do think, I know you all have a lot on your plate, but this is such a critical issue. And if um, we do have a, an effort underway and on a DAGA to sort of set the, uh, 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 the policies and standards and, and they're a little bit ahead of the game, it may be a good opportunity if NICLAC could just take it up as an issue, an ongoing issue, to try to continue to work in that area. I think it would be extremely beneficial. I know that New York City has um, had a contract for request. Is New York City going to be able to do this? But it's, there's a new contract with a new vendor. To um, we had this discussion a couple yeah. times. We're not really prepared to discuss the uh, those systems. We, we talk about our laboratory system, but we're not, we're not prepared to talk about anything outside the laboratory. Yeah, Harvey, in rare cases where lab uh, material goes into court, becomes an exhibit, and is retained, let's say, during the trial by the clerk in the particular courtroom, and then the, there's, there's a conviction. What happens to the evidence at that point? The evidence, well, once once it leaves our laboratory, it either goes directly back to the agency, which is generally 99% of the time. <coughs> On some occasions, it may be turned over to the district attorney's office also for for use in court if it hasn't gone back to the agency yet. After after court is done with it, it never comes back to the laboratory. Right. It would go back to the receiving agency or be kept by the DA's office in there. Uh, vault areas. Bill, could I ask Kathy what what, 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 we, what, we, uh, what trial I just had last month? We we maintain control of the evidence during the course of the trial proceeding. Probably ninety percent of it we don't use. That that which is admitted into evidence and the unused portion is returned to the uh, arresting agency and stored in their property rooms for a period of time. Past which time the you know the appeal is uh, finalized because you've got you know habeas corpus and 440 motions and so forth. And so no, on. nothing stays with the clerk of the court. Correct. Uh, yes. Yeah. I had an element of concern. Uh, is this the being hyperbolic? But it went, and with respect to the question, how is evidence stored in your laboratory? There seem to be two basic answers. One is in some very secure vault, and then the other answer is at times retained in other than in, the, in, a, in a very secure vault. It could be at a local station, it could be at a particular discipline's uh, private stock or whatever. Uh, is there any uh, effort on the way to look into uh, the temporary storage of, uh, of evidence within the laboratory and making sure that those temporary storage places are actually secure uh, uh, to the extent that they have to be, because it, it, it does seem that certain, it, a minority of the labs, when the evidence is checked out to the examiner, you know, it's basically a shoebox. Isn't that a part it's, of the ASPAD lab requirement? It's, I know that ABFT right. requires it, and I'm sure that ASPAD lab does too. It, it's part of our inspection process too. They look at that to see what you're doing with your evidence uh, from the time it it arrives in the laboratory to the time it actually leaves the laboratory. So when they come in and inspect the laboratories, they look at to see, do you have a tracking system uh, so you know where the evidence is? When it's in process, where is it kept? Do you have to have a secure facility, a secure area to keep it in process while you're not done with it? If you go to lunch, you have to have a secure area to put it in where it's locked where no one else can get at it. Those kinds of things are examined in our accreditation inspection every time we have an inspection. So I think they cover that there, and they're, they're pretty thorough on that. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the next item on the agenda concerns um, the referral um, from this um, commission to the DNA subcommittee regarding uh, asking for an opinion from them um, on scientific and technical aspects related to compliance with the FBI um, procedure uh, related to partial match um, information. Um, the DNA subcommittee formed a subcommittee, um, including um, Drs. Carmody, Deuceman, and Prince, um, to study the issue 
<coughs> and that would be reporting back um, to us. So I know there was a request, particularly from Barry, not to or to not to get into the issue right now. Um, we're not getting into the issue. We're really on hold until we get an opinion back um, from the DNA subcommittee before we further um, put that item on the agenda or take any other action related to that matter. But I just wanted to let you know where it stood at the present time. Thanks. Uh, uh, I, I should uh, make a note that um, we've asked a, uh, uh, an expert in this area, Dr. Daniel Crane, uh, to see if he could uh, meet on with the subcommittee um, and just review. And this is all has to do with the, the technical data, you know, trying to come up with uh, the window or the, uh, the statistics. What's what's degree of uh, relationship? Uh, one gets when you come up with certain formulas and searching databases. And uh, uh, we were going to ask him to get in touch with members of the subcommittee so they could, he could see what the, the formulas are that are being considered and proposed and maybe make some suggestions if that's okay. I think that's a matter for the DNA subcommittee. Okay, if well, you want to, you know, so I don't know. We've but asked to us, We've asked I, I, I think... Um, we can. They're taking the matter under advisement, so I think there's some of our country's leading <laughs> DNA um, scientists, and if they feel it would be helpful, I'm sure they can decide whether or not to work with them or not. Okay. Um, I just want to, we have in your materials an updated chart of past and current matters um, that Coverdale um, matters that have been referred to the IG. A uh, matter that we discussed today has been added to that list. This is just informational only, but um, it's our procedure now to track all of our cases. And so you have an updated uh, list um, with respect to those, uh, those matters. Okay, the next matter uh, under all business is a 2008 laboratory annual reporting matter. Um, again, pertaining to corrective action with the Nassau County Office of the Medical Examiner. Uh, Barry um, uh, asked that this be added to the list. And um, so uh, do we have somebody here from Nassau County? Karen Dooling okay. is the Assistant Lab Director from Nassau Karen, welcome. Submitted here. So basically, uh, five sporadic sample contaminations in one sample mix up. Uh, maybe you could tell us exactly what you think the source of that was and how you uh, fix it. Um, first, I'd just like to preface that I think that we're probably here because of semantics. In our laboratory, we call everything quality incident, no matter what it is, a, a corrective action. Um, so I don't even think, as far as ASCOT Lab is concerned, these are the type of corrective actions that they would even call corrective actions. Or, um, And I also want to preface by saying that in each of these incidences, no reports went out. We didn't have to issue any amended reports or, or anything like that. Um, so we did submit a chart to you with all the corrective actions that we had for, the, for May 5th to 2006 to October 13th of 2007. Um, there were seven corrective actions that we had. Um, there were one, two, three, four, five contamination events. They're all really diagrammed here um, with a description and a resolution for each one of them. So I don't know if you want to talk about them individually or... Well, in reading it just sounds like there's a bad lot of uh, the agents. Is that well, e each one is, each one is, is actually uh, different. For, in one, we had, um, and I, I should say in most of these events, they were, the contamination we noticed was even below our threshold for, for what we would even call DNA type or, or alleles. But each one of these issues are, are actually different. Um, minor contamination in, in different parts of the process. In one, it was in um, 
in a reagent, you know, in another, um, in a negative, you know, in low, low levels. And whenever we have something like this, we uh, always go back and we determine what we think is the source of the problem. And um, anything that needs to be reanalyzed gets reanalyzed. Um, so in that, you know, we could talk about them each individually, or? Well, I, I think that many of them are, are very well documented and are self-evident. I was just curious about the, uh, the one having to do with uh, adjacent casework that uh, uh, it appeared that, that samples from one case got into another, and how did that happen? And the last uh, one, number seven. Number seven. I mean, all the others, obviously. Are, you could probably either call this analyst error or contamination, um, but what happened was that um, the analyst pipetted an adjacent sample into the sample next to it, uh, which was very evident because in our quality program we have duplication rules and policies. So the analyst came and said, you know, the, these results are not important, we have a problem. We did an investigation and we were able to investigate back that this was the exact stage that it happened in. What had happened? These were samples in the same case. Uh, nope, two different cases, because there were two cases involved in it. So then, what we do is we go back, we take a step back, and we amplify the samples. Well, first we reran them, see if we get the same result. We take a step back from there, we reamplify them, and then again to make sure that we have important results and we can show exactly where the problem happens. Thank you very much. This is extremely helpful. But I would point out that that last one is the one that is a matter of some concern because anybody can get a bad set of uh, uh, <coughs> contaminated stock from the Paraplex Y kit, and uh, very often one can have uh, you know some shedding or contaminant uh, uh, within a negative control. That's all to be expected. But when you start taking samples from one case and putting them in another. That, that kind of thing is, uh, feels just a little bit more problematic to me. I don't know how that can happen. Um, I mean, it can happen. We know that can happen. I would say that it's contamination can happen at any portion of the DNA process. Nobody denies that, which is why we have quality programs with negative controls and, and lots of other things that would indicate if your stock was contaminated, which our quality program picked up here. Can we talk just, just in general? We done this before, um, sure. but can you just talk about what causes contamination in, in terms of, you know, just some of the items that cause um, contamination in, in this kind of a situation? You know, there, there are lots of things that can cause contamination, I guess. Contamination with an adjacent sample, an analyst error, um, like you saw in that one instance we were talking about. Um, Lots of, lots of things that can cause contamination. But okay. I, I think that the real question is, I mean, do you agree that number seven is the one that's troublesome? That's, that's not just contamination from a reagent, that's cross-contamination. That's literally that he's taking, if I understand you correctly, they took evidence from one case and they put it in another. Is that right? They took a sample from one to and put it in another. And again, our quality program has ways to ensure yeah. that we can detect this. And in every one of these instances, it was an analyst coming to me without even a technical review saying, we have a problem. Which, for me, these are all evidence that my quality system is working. And I think that's what's important is this comes, this list comes from each of the labs during every period of time reporting <clears throat> any kind of error or mistake that occurs at a lab to ASCLAD labs so that ASCLAD labs can review them and make sure um, that the quality systems work, that there isn't any problem that has been addressed. And so I think it's important that we recognize that this is not pointing the finger just at your lab. I mean, no lab is perfect. Every lab is going to have some of these issues as we see um, on the report um, that goes in every year. So. Um, no, I appreciate Thank you very much. We greatly mm -hmm. appreciate it, and I understand why you don't call this a quote-unquote corrective action.
sense of... I do call it a corrective action. That's why I'm here. I think you said it was a semantical problem at the beginning. Well, some labs might not call it a corrective action. It might be part of the quality assurance procedures. And we might not see this from other laboratories. I appreciate that, and that's what I want to continue. But I would like to add that when we have our inspections and when we get our accreditation and every year when the FBI comes, somebody comes and goes through that quality document and audits us, these things are reviewed. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Great. I'm going to try to move forward. We still have a lot of items on the agenda. Okay. So, new business. Gina, do you want to address this issue? Yeah. You have a binding recommendation letter in your packet from the DNA subcommittee to modify Part 6190.1 and 6192.1 of the NYCRR. This is a non-substantive amendment just to remove references to outdated editions of the Ask Lab Lab Guidelines, the ABFT manual, the FBI's DNA quality assurance standards, and the ENDIS standards, and to just refer to the standards and guidelines themselves as opposed to dated editions, which have become outdated. I have no problem with this except that, so we're clear, we call it non-substantive. With respect to the amendment to Subdivision T of Section 61921 of Title IX, where the term NDIS standards for acceptance of DNA data, that's just saying that you're now changing the reference to the document. That is not in any way to be taken as substantive approval of this committee with respect to any of the issues that we debated with respect to the legality of disclosing in the partial match situation or in the familial searching situation data, right? That wasn't changed. The only thing changed in there is the deletion of the address and the effective date. Okay. Yeah, that wasn't. Okay, the next item on the agenda, unfortunately, pertains to, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, we need to vote. I'm sorry. I move the amendments consistent with the provided material. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the motion is carried. Okay, I'm sorry to try to move this forward even quicker than I should have. The next item does pertain to an issue that the labs are very aware of, but I think it's important that the commission members be aware, and that is the loss or potential loss of Article VI DOH funding to the medical examiner labs, and in some cases, I think, I believe, counties are interpreting that as a loss to all of the labs in the way that they're dealing with funding issues. The budget is coming to a close. It's not closed. I don't know if there's going to be any redress to those budget cuts. They were substantial in the Department of Health budget. We have made these concerns known to the Department of Health, and I know various labs have advocated for the importance of restoring that funding. If it is not restored, it's a very serious issue facing a number of our labs in terms of the funding cuts that they'll sustain this year. So I think it's important that everyone be aware of it. You have some materials indicating the impact on particular labs, and we'll address that going forward when we know what the budget situation is, but I think it is something that everyone is going to have to be aware of going forward. Is it appropriate for us to take a vote of sense of the committee to communicate to the powers that be that this group at least regards these as a matter of very serious and great concern, particularly when you look at the whole discussion of the way medical examiner's offices are treated in the National Academy of Science report. This seems to me to be moving in the worst direction possible. So I would move that we communicate to the governor and the leader of the Senate and the Speaker of the Assembly that we regard these cuts as great and a real threat to 
reliable and accurate results in the criminal justice system. Any other uh, discussion? I, I, um, I know the budget process is moving rather quickly, so I don't know that we'll be able to have an impact other than what we've already tried to do. But I think I think we all share uh, Barry's sentiments on this. So is there a second to the motion? Well, before, before we second it, Barry, we all agree with you. But we just don't want Denise to have to go tell her boss that his budget stinks. <laughs> well, that, that's the beauty of this. You know, <laughs> I'm worried, I'm worried about say, Denise. Why don't this you This is coming from me. This is coming from my commission. <laughs> I, second, I second the motion, and I say Barry should deliver the message. <laughs> well, I think the governor and, and the, the legislature knows that this is a matter of grave concern. Um, I have raised the issue, and um, I know others have. Um, so, um, you know, I think it's important that the commission make known its views, but I, I do think that um, the governor knows that the labs are extremely important um, to New York. So, um, whether you want to uh, make that into a motion or not is really up to the commission. So? I second. Okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any uh, opposed? Okay. I abstain. Okay. I abstain. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Um, all right. The next item on the agenda is really uh, something at the heart of our agenda here. And um, we really have, I think, two matters um, of, of concern. And, and um, I think we'll only begin to scratch the surface today because we have about an hour left on um, two matters that probably could take several um, days to really um, consider in, in full. Um, but I am, as you can see, I have to answer my phone, but I am going to open the discussion and, um, and, and the discussion is really about the NAS report um, that Barry has already alluded to, I'm sure you're all very aware of, um, and uh, an ex executive summary is provided in the binder. Um, but just um, to, to open it up, and I will um, turn it over to Barry initially um, to talk about his um, view of the report, because I know the Innocence Commission has been very involved in it. Um, we, you know, on the commission, um, I think take very seriously issues with respect to um, the validity of, of science and the validity of the um, work that is done in our forensic laboratories. Um, I think New York leads the country in many ways in terms of the fact that we have this commission, um, the fact that we have an accreditation process, um, the fact that we have a vigorous um, Coverdale um, protocol in place here. Um, so I think that we have taken um, many forward uh, thinking steps, but there's a lot of work to be done in this area. So I'm going to um, turn it over to you initially, Barry, and if you can, because we can't cover everything today, you know, keep it to maybe 10 or 15 minutes so we can have some discussion if you, and then we'll, um, we'll um, decide what the, any further action that the Commission wants to take. Perhaps less than that. Uh, it seems to me that, uh, as you see, the National Academy of Sciences, uh, which is the leading and authoritative scientific uh, body in this country, uh, spent a lot of time, uh, took a lot of testimony, uh, and proposed that there ought to be a National Institute of Forensic Science that would accomplish a lot of purposes. Uh, uh, you know. Some of them, as you said, Denise, uh, they really were citing New York uh, in terms of our regulatory system. Uh, that is, uh, in being able to get the labs accredited. I know there's problems with, uh, uh, they're obviously indicating that every member of lab personnel has to be certified. <coughs> we're not there yet. That's uh, potentially expensive, but that's money well spent. Uh, uh, so in many ways, I think that uh, what they're calling for in this report, if it really comes into existence, as we hope it will, uh, uh, in this session of Congress, uh, New York is, is ready and ahead of the curve as far as our regulatory structure is concerned. Because of this commission's work over the last, I mean, how many years have we been in existence now? Uh, 
Last year, Mario was got more, more, more than ten. More than ten. Drago <laughs> <laughs> says more than ten. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Longer than uh, fifteen. The I think the heart of it, though, uh, the heart of the concern here for us uh, has to do with uh, chapters uh, four, five, and six of the report. Um, uh, one of them having to do with just uh, the scientific method. Uh, and uh, there I would really commend people's attention on uh, chapter 4, page 7. There's a very straightforward and simple discussion of what it means to have an error rate in uh, the scientific, uh, uh, in terms of the scientific method, how one determines, you know, uh, true, true uh, positive rate, sensitivity, specificity, and true negative rate, uh, uh, et cetera. Uh, there's discussion of sources of human bias and observer bias, and these issues have come up already today, and they're not really uh, matters of uh, dispute within the scientific community that these phenomena exists, and that uh, there ought to be, if you can, uh, the discipline is really validated, you should be able to uh, make an assessment of that. Uh, but I guess the, uh, uh, the key chapter it has to do with chapter five. And in Chapter 5, the Commission reviews uh, a whole series of disciplines and pattern evidence. And they reach some conclusions which are um, uh, extremely important. Now, uh, having to do with the underlying scientific basis of some of these, most, uh, uh, of these disciplines. I, I should say at the outset that uh, I'm not sure that it's going to be completely fruitful uh, to you know, at, say, ah, tomorrow uh, somebody's going to go into court and cite this report and try to knock out fingerprint evidence, tool marks on bullets, tool marks on cartridges, shoe print impressions, tire impressions, uh, uh, and the rest of it, uh, uh, and even attack to some degree uh, uh, partial latent fingerprints uh, and how that's reported out. Uh, that will undoubtedly happen. <laughs> Uh, because this language is uh, so stunning. Um, and I think just in terms of the overall recommendation of the commission to set up a national entity that actually has federal money that's devoted to doing uh, basic and applied research, but particularly applied research, getting a lot of engineers to take a look at these things so we can come up with some answers, uh, I think it's just in everybody's <coughs> interest. Uh, uh, there's a whole chapter here on the, uh, the lack of interoperability of the APHIS system. So if you just start thinking of this report in terms of, number one, there's problems in how prints are uh, read, latent prints, and what you can say about their significance. Uh, going ahead a little bit to, our eight, to the New York State Bar Association report, there's a recommendation there that this commission uh, make sure that it has jurisdiction over fingerprint uh, uh, gathering uh, and analysis uh, outside of the crime lab as well as inside the crime lab. Uh, and then you think about the fact that we can't get a print uh, run from New York and New Jersey and vice versa. This is a joke. This is an outrage. And that's what this commission says. And this problem has to be solved. And it only really can be solved by a, a, a federal agency. Equally, I don't think we're going to have the resources to do the kind of research that's required in all these pattern evidence unless we have a federal commitment. So it would seem to me, no matter what the differences that many of us have around this table, about uh, maybe some of the specifics here, uh, I think we all should be able to agree that it would be a good thing if there was a national commitment. It would help the police, it would help the crime labs, it would help prosecutors, uh, it would help defendants, and it would help uh, apprehend criminals and protect the innocent. So that's our view. Uh, now, with respect to just some of the things that uh, we talked about today, um, the Commission points out in Chapter 5, uh, first discussing uh, fingerprint analysis. Um, if you go to page 5-9, uh, they cite a, a, a series of studies by Etel, Drawer, and others, <coughs> where, uh, and they have a little box about this, where fingerprint analysts were given work that they'd already done in cases where people felt that the results were clear, okay? And they were asked to reanalyze them 
and they were told, oh, this is the Brandon Mayfield case, or they were told, oh, there's a confession in this case. And looking at their own work, in 17% of the cases, they got different results. Now, that's stunning. That's stuff you've already examined, and you're looking at it again, and you can't replicate your own prior results. So if that doesn't tell you that in the area of fingerprint comparison, there are problems of observer bias, frankly, nothing will in terms of proof. And, uh, uh, you know, I mean, and they conclude. It, it appears that uh, friction ridge analysis is not necessarily repeatable from examiner to examiner. Uh, they then go on to say, in their summary assessment, uh, uh, on page 512, although there is limited information about the accuracy and reliability of friction ridge analysis, claims that these analyses have a zero error rates are not scientifically plausible. And, and what's clear here is that when, you know, as you all know, there is no objective agreed upon standard for how many points, quote unquote, or ridges of identity between a latent print uh, found at a crime scene uh, and known prints uh, uh, within agencies and between agencies in this country and across the world. Uh, but at the end of an analysis, when a fingerprint examiner comes into court and starts doing the comparisons, the fingerprint analyst says, this is, this latent comes from this person. And they're stating it as, a, as an actual identity, a complete individualization. They're not saying plus or minus. <laughs> some percentage, or they're not qualifying it in any way. They're literally saying there's a zero error rate. We know this latent comes from this person. It's all or nothing. And that is not scientifically plausible. That's what the National Academy of Science says. Now they go on to say um, that, uh, I mean, one, these things can be studied. Uh, uh, that. Uh, I'll read a whole paragraph here. Uniqueness and persistence are necessary conditions for friction rate identification to be feasible. But those conditions do not imply that anyone can reliably discern whether or not two friction ridge impressions were made by the same person. <coughs> Uniqueness must not guarantee that prints from two people are always sufficiently different that they cannot be confused, or that two impressions made by the same finger will also be sufficiently similar to be discerned as coming from the same source. Uh, the impression left by a given finger will differ every time because of the inevitable variations in pressure, which change the degree of contact between each part of the ridge structure and the impression medium. None of these variabilities of features across the population of fingers or of repeated impressions by, left by the same figure has been characterized, quantified, or compared. Uh, so they call for additional research into ridge flow, increased pattern distributions on the hands and feet, um, and this research is actually beginning. There is a project now going on at the National Institute of Justice and uh, uh, NIST where they're beginning to look at it, but the resources available to that, even the people doing the study will tell you are not sufficient. And the reason that I'm really raising this is that if uh, uh, bodies like ours were simply to voice support for the idea of the National Institute of Forensic Science and the need to get this research done, whether or not you take the position, if we go into court tomorrow, the fingerprint shouldn't be admitted or uh, however, I think that's just helpful to everybody because it's only the federal commitment that's going to get this done. Uh, and, and so fingerprints are well known. They go on to say the same thing about shoe prints and tire marks. Uh, uh, page 517, there is no consensus regarding the number of individual characteristics needed to make. Uh, a positive identification. This has to do with uh, uh, tire impressions and shoe prints, and the committee is not aware of any data about the variability of class or individual characteristics or about the validity or reliability of the method. Without such population studies, it's impossible to assess the number of characteristics that must match in order to have a particular degree of confidence about the source of the impression. Uh, probably, for our purposes, I would think the most common uh, uh, most frequent, and, and people from the crime lab should correct me, we do not say that compared to bite marks, which they find, have no, you know, has very limited scientific value of any, uh, shoe prints, tire marks, putting aside fingerprints, would it not be tool marks on bullets, that, and tool marks on cartridges, that is the most common discipline 
the biggest amount of work that the labs do in terms of patterns? I'm looking around the room. Does anybody disagree with that? No, that's probably okay. Uh, Pardon? That's probably correct. Okay, so we had a presentation uh, uh, in our commission, I guess, for the last time that I think are very well reflected in the minutes uh, where I, some questions were being asked uh, uh, of our guest who was supporting uh, uh, tool mark ballistic identifications and continued to insist that he had enough <coughs> data to say that he could look at a bullet and link it to a gun to the exclusion of all other guns on the planet. And the National Academy of Science says that this ain't so. Uh, in fact, I think there was a specific uh, uh, observation uh, from an earlier National Academy of Science report where they were trying to create uh, a ballistics database. The NRC was asked to look at uh, Nibin and Nibis and all these efforts so you could trace bullets to guns, which would be of enormous investigative value. I think you go to the jury, and they couldn't do it. And the, uh, uh, the ballistic, uh, this report concluded, quote, the validity of the fundamental assumptions of the uniqueness and reproducibility of firearms related tool marks has not yet been fully demonstrated. Uh, that was the statement. I pointed that out to our guest. He said, oh, that only has to do with imaging. That has nothing to do with the underlying basis of uh, uh, tool mark identification. Uh, if you read pages 520 to 521 in the National Academy of Science report, you will see that his answer is uh, profoundly rejected. Uh, <coughs> again, uh, uh, 521, uh, as you know, uh, the expert came in and said, well, we can take a look at the patterns on, limited patterns of striations on the bullet uh, found at the crime scene and compare it to one that was subsequently fired on the gun. And uh, terms are used like exceeds best agreement and consistent with. Uh, the Academy says you, you, you really can't say that, uh, and uh, they go on to address that. So uh, there's lots of other discussion about terms that you hear every day in court. This is consistent with uh, somebody, you know, uh, uh, best agreement, et cetera, and they really reject these as not being scientific terms uh, with respect to really stating the probative force of any particular one of these pattern forensic disciplines. So uh, uh, this is a big challenge. And the reason why I've been stressing in this meeting again uh, why it's so important to have, uh, whether it's blind proficiency testing, I think blind meetings, uh, in terms of uh, tool mark identification of bullets and, and fingerprints, is that I continue to believe these are the easiest ones uh, to create, let's say, blind cases, just a few of them. Uh, and these are the disciplines where the National Academy of Science is saying <coughs> there's a serious problem uh, that in terms of the underlying scientific data, uh, it's simply not there in terms of the way these results are reported. Uh, uh, it, it's not scientifically plausible to say I, this bullet comes from this gun to the exclusion of all others in the universe uh, without having a database that tells you about the variability of these trial on bullets. That's what they say. I mean, it's like when we asked the examiner. I think Peter asked him the question. Uh, how can you say it's plus or minus 99%? Or how can you say it's 99% as opposed to 95%? Where are you getting these numbers? He doesn't have any place to get these numbers. He starts off by assuming that all bullets that come from guns are necessarily uniquely linked to another gun. And that's not science. That's just a, a, an unproven assumption. That's what these people say. And that's pretty serious stuff. Thank you. Any other comments? You know, Barry, the, the, the report, I mean, it's new, it's interesting. Um, and it's a national situation. It's not just this commission, it's not just New York State. And as you stated, uh, we're probably ahead of the curve. I, I think the only way we can move forward is to start to, to listen to who's driving the bus. And so I think we probably need to get some national people here or have a symposium of some sort to just to try to figure out what next steps might be. Because certainly in, in, in financial times, I mean, they make a lot of assertions, but they don't fix anything. 
And, mm. and so we're left here holding, uh, I like to talk a metaphor, so we, we have this menu, but we don't have any cooks. Uh, so I think that perhaps, you know, if we are to, to look at this report seriously, we have to figure out who we need to bring in here, who we need to listen to on both sides to try to try to, to move forward and, and you know we need to have another discussion that basically is what I'm saying. We can't solve it today. And we're not going to be able to solve it, Harry, and I completely agree with you. And just to give you a sense of this is that you're absolutely right. This is a national problem. I can't ask Kathy Corrado or anyone else in the crime lab uh, uh, to solve the basic underlying scientific problems in tool mark identification or the problems with fingerprints or uh, the, the difficulties we have with the interoperability of APHIS, right? These are federal problems. They require national commitment of lots of money. Um, and one thing that this report talks about are the backlogs in crime labs, the underfunding of crime labs. Uh, if you want to have a federal commission that says everybody's got to be a certified, well, you've got to give money to the state and local crime labs to pay for that kind of training and certification. Uh, that's why I think that uh, what, when you examine this report, what I hope ultimately what this commission could do is just come at really uh, in the, uh, a resolution of support that there ought to be a National Institute, a National Forensic Science Institute. Do. But that necessarily say, uh, I agree with what they say about pattern recognition or I don't. Uh, but uh, just an understanding that this is a federal problem because state and local government cannot pay this freight to get people accredited, certified, much less do the key research that we need. Um, and you know, I, this is how you catch criminals. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's how fingerprints, ballistics, being able to do this right is absolutely indispensable to uh, Next action is by the Congress. It is by the Congress. And, and uh, we expect that uh, bills are going to be introduced soon uh, on the federal level. And uh, I don't know if it's appropriate for a commission or any of you here that are prosecutors, members of law enforcement, crime labs. I, I think it would be uh, in everybody's interest to try to support legislation that creates this national institute, particularly from the point of view of New York State. Because uh, a lot of the things everybody's afraid of in terms of creating commissions and being accredited and all the rest of it, we're already doing that. <laughs> uh, what we really need is the. Uh, scientific research. So it's one perspective. Okay. Another yeah. another perspective. I, I, I don't anticipate my going back to my office and telling a victim of a homicide his family that I'm sorry we can't proceed with this case because all we have is the murder weapon in the guy's briefcase uh, that ballistically matched the bullet that went into your son's head and we have his fingerprint at the crime scene but that's not enough because they're subject to different interpretation. I'd be drummed out, of, as I should be, I'd be drummed out of town in the internet. Look, let me say a couple of things. Uh, and I want to try to keep the comments positive. I have some real problems with the report, but there are some good things in it. I have no problem with uh, a lot of the things that Barry said, but I do have some problems with some. First of all, this came out with a lot of hyperbole. Uh, it, was, it was leaked early. There were a number of people that were quoted anonymously. You see quotes like shoddy scientific practices a, quote, sweeping critique of many forensic methods, so forth and so on. And then when you actually read the thing, it, it, it's underwhelming to me in, in the recommendations it makes. And Denise and Barry are correct that we are way, way ahead of the curve here in New York. But I'd just like to keep a couple of things in mind about the commission itself. Um, in all fairness, the group is top-heavy, bottom-heavy, and middle-heavy with, with academics. And not surprisingly, one of the main things that they recommend is that universities throughout the country get tons and tons of money to study all of these issues. Which, and this is the same group, by the way, that said in 1992 that uh, you know the court should cease to allow DNA evidence uh, to be heard until years of studies were done on that particular issue. Uh, another thing that concerns me is that there wasn't a single practicing prosecutor that either sat on the commission sat on one of the subcommittees or testified in, in, in front of this group. I mean, if you're, going to have a, if you're going to have a commission that's going to study, you know, airline traffic safety, I think you ought to have a couple of pilots come in and testify as to what the thing is all about. 
And with all due respect, the notion that Congress in, in this day and age, and I'm not saying they can't take it up at some point in the future, but at this, in this day and age is suddenly going to create the National Institute for Forensic Science, I, I don't think is going to happen, nor, I, nor do I think it should happen. I mean, is there anybody here that would trust the forensic sciences in our country to a national institute? I mean, these people can't get bottled water to the Superdome for five days, and we're going to turn over what we do to a national institute? I, I, I think that's something that should frighten everybody in the room. Uh, recommendation number two, standardization of terminology, great idea. Uh, recommendation number three, <coughs> fund uh, peer-reviewed research to measure reliability. We're doing that in many, many areas. If they want to spend more on that, uh, that's fine. Right now, one of the things that Barry was concerned with earlier about the DNA mixture, right now the FBI has got a scientific working group working on that. Uh, recommendation number four, remove all public forensic laboratories from control of law enforcement. Soup, you can have all the talkers you want, and there ain't no way that Superintendent Harry Corbett is going to relinquish control of the New York State Police Crime Lab to civilians, whether I think he should or not. I, uh, I have the luxury of having a forensic uh, science laboratory in Onondaga uh, County that's run by civilians. Uh, there are three in the United States that are actually run by prosecutor's offices. You can imagine how that, that works out. But again, it's not something that's going to happen in New York State. Uh, recommendation number five has to do with bias, and I think we should do everything we can uh, in the forensic sciences to eliminate the possibility of bias. Recommendation number six has to do with accreditation, not applicable in New York State, we already mandate accreditation. Recommendation number seven, accreditation of professionals. That's a great idea and I'm supporting it. But I know from experience trying cases for 30 years that a judge is going to allow somebody who's not accredited to come into court and testify for the defense. So it's a one-sided issue. Sure, prosecution witnesses should be accredited. And if there isn't, if they are accredited, it doesn't mean that the defense lawyer is going to suddenly stand up and say, geez, he's an honest guy, he really makes a lot of sense, we change our plea to guilty. It's not going to happen. I just had a trial in my county where some guy came into town. Will Rogers said an expert is some guy from out of town. Well, this guy was from out of town. He just came into my county and said that these vicious injuries to this little baby were caused by mold in her grandmother's washing machine. And this guy goes all over the country with a cottage industry testifying to the stuff. And it's allowed. And it's going to be allowed after this NAS report is, is published. Recommendation number eight has to do with quality assurance. It's already being done in New York. Recommendation number nine has to do with a code of ethics, uh, which I think is a great idea. And uh, in fact, has been acted on to some extent by uh, NICLAC in our state. Uh, recommendation number ten, dollars uh, for schools, again, money for schools, to, to encourage uh, studies in forensics and training for law students and practitioners and judges. Judge McQuillan, with all due respect, I think the emphasis should be on the judge's part of that, but uh, I have no problem with that. Uh, recommendation number 11 is something that I actually recommend uh, very strongly in New York State, uh, elimination of the coroner system. And, you know, a lot of people will get upset about that because that's their, their side job. Uh, some of my colleagues as DAs are actually coroners in the state of New York. Every, every unexplained, unattended death in the state of New York, in this day and age, should be examined by a competent, accredited forensic pathologist. I just finished a murder case where a, a woman killed two husbands, the first one out of my county, and the first husband wasn't even autopsy. In the year 2000, we're not talking about 1980 or something, in the year 2000, that's, that's ridiculous. Recommendation number 12, more money for uh, fingerprint data interoperability. I don't know why they want that, if fingerprints is such an inexact, ridiculous junk science, but if they want that, that's okay with me, because I think that, as I agree with Barry, that's something that, that should be done. Recommendation number 13 uh, has to do with homeland security, and it, it really doesn't uh, apply to us. Look, I just, have, I just encourage people to look at the report itself, not just the press reports, not just the executive summary. Uh, I, I've had... Fingerprint evidence in trials for 30 years. I believe it to be reliable. I believe it. I, I believe uh, the same about ballistics evidence. I believe you look at the report. They essentially uh, agree with that. They, 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 you know, Barry quoted some of the report. Let me quote some of the report that says, in reference to fingerprint impressions, quote: "It seems plausible that a careful comparison of two impressions can accurately discern whether or not they had a common source." Close quotes. 
And I know that you know many of us now that the, the issue du jour is criticizing fingerprint science, and we all we all point to the Mayfield case, uh, which caused a, a completely innocent individual to languish in jail for I think two to three weeks as a material witness. Uh, it wasn't the failure of fingerprint science, it was the failure of a fingerprint analyst. And correct me if I'm wrong, Barry, the defense analyst agreed with the original FBI guy that it was Mayfield's fingerprint. So it wasn't just the FBI, it's more of an institutional problem than it is the problem with the science itself. When qualified, competent analysts looked at that print, they clearly said it was not Mr. Mayfield. And I would recommend that all fingerprint examiners in New York, at the, at the first step, receive DCJS training, and more importantly, uh, be accredited and be accredited by this group. I can, you know, I, I agree there are sharp shortcomings on tool mark identifications, but not on ballistics, uh, tire track impressions. I've tried 75 murder cases in my life. I've never used a tire track impression in a case. I, I'm sure that there are instances anecdotally throughout the state, throughout the country. I can remember uh, remember the prosecutor and my cousin Vinny. Hair evidence. Uh, my lab. We don't even do. We don't even do hair evidence. Uh, hair evidence can be, you know, could be potentially helpful if you got uh, mitochondrial DNA or nuclear DNA. But uh, hair and fiber evidence can be can be assisting to a jury. But no examiner should come into court and say that hair came from that defendant. That's the problem. Not necessarily problem of science, but a problem of law. Uh, blood spatter, bite mark, I can go on and on. Bite mark evidence, and, and it, we, we were cited to the Roy Brown case, and I, and I, I want to mention this for just a second, and, and Barry and Peter worked on Roy Brown, an absolute disgraceful miscarriage of justice, where a guy was convicted partially on a uh, forensic odontologist, well, I, I say that, I, I don't imagine this person will ever testify again, but test, testify that that bite mark came from, on the body of the victim, came from <clears throat> the defendant. And there's a lot of problems with that. But here's the real problem with that case. Lowell Levine, who I have a lot of respect for, who is a forensic odontologist, opined before trial to the prosecutor that it wasn't, in his opinion, the defendant. And the defense expert testified in front of the jury that it wasn't the defendant. So once again, it wasn't the problem necessarily with the science, it was a problem with the ethics of the prosecutor. And I, I'll talk about that in a second. And the DNA they refer to as the gold standard, which as well as should, which it doesn't mean that we should be constantly retreating in this group with the new things that are coming up that DNA can do, uh, such as familial matching and such as taking DNA at arrest. Last couple of points. The convictions that the NAS report looked at, and some of these are necessarily old because of the passage of time and the necessary and, the, and the, the later involvement of the Innocence Project, because they, you're not going to get a conviction. I don't know what your criteria are, Barry, but I would assume that if you're going to have to wait till some appellate process runs its course before you personally get involved in your law. I may be, I may be wrong on that, but of the cases they heard, just under 240. Eight cases came from the 70s, 162 cases came from the 80s, 62 cases came from the 90s, and four cases came from our current decade. And in those four cases, every single one of them, the major factor leading to the conviction of the defendant was mistaken identification. In New York State, we just had the New York State Bar Association issue a report on wrongful convictions, which again made some very, very good recommendations. But of the 53 cases that they examined, the most recent case was from 2004, and the most recent one before that was from 1998. So nobody, nobody in their right mind is not going to be thoroughly repulsed and disgusted by a wrongful conviction. It is anathema. But we, what we have to look for is what are the real causes for wrongful convictions? And I suggest to you that faulty science is one of the least causes, whereas if you read the press reports from the about the NAS reports, they try to suggest to you that it's the major cause. I suggest to you that uh, we do have an adversarial system in our country and in our state. You cannot have a system where we process crime labs to death and where you have, a, you have the standard of proof doesn't become beyond a reasonable doubt, but be, becomes 
It has to be an absolute foolproof certainty, restudied, studied, and studied again. I don't think that anybody in this room is ever going to welcome a society where that is the case. Let me suggest to you that most of these convictions, wrongful convictions, have to do with bad lawyering, unethical prosecutors, faulty eyewitness identifications for various reasons, false confessions, and then at the very, very end, I would say, faulty forensic science, and not very much in the last decade. Now, let me explain to you what I can do and what I have done as a member of this commission. Because I knew these reports were coming out, last July, along with Jim Murphy, who sits here, my, my colleague from Saratoga County, we made and passed a motion in front of the State DA's Association to create a standing committee of the State DA's Association called the, the Committee on the Fair Administration of Justice in the State of New York. Starting this summer, a committee of the most experienced homicide and major felony prosecutors in the state of New York are going to be tasked with, number one, reviewing claims of innocence that come into any county in the state of New York with the consent of the elected district attorney. Number two, we are going to conduct regional periodic training sessions for prosecutors and police on the major issues that have been identified and discussed in the NAS report and in the New York State Bar Association report that lead to wrongful convictions, as well as recommending the best practices for the collection, preservation, and presentation of evidence in court. And lastly, and I, 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 I point back to the uh, Roy Brown case, we are going to, when appropriate, refer for appropriate disciplinary action prosecutors in this state whose unethical conduct has led to a potential wrongful conviction. It is unacceptable to have the only sanction for someone who, who did what happened in the Roy Brown case or any other case where a prosecutor intentionally withheld evidence. I'm not suggesting that happened. The person hasn't had a full and fair opportunity to be heard. But they ought to have had a full and fair opportunity to be heard. And somebody ought to have done something about it long before the New York State Bar Association had to write their report. So my fellow brother and sister prosecutors will be taking that upon ourselves. And if we don't do a good job, shame on us. But I suggest to you that we will be doing a good job. So I offer those perspectives. But I ask you to take away from my comments the common ground that I have <laughs> with Barry and with the NAS report and with the Bar Association report, which is what we're ultimately charged with. As prosecutors, my job is to find the truth about what happened and present that to 12 impartial citizens. Barry's job, apart from the Innocence Project, is to represent his or her client as vigorously as possible to the best of his ability at a trial. You've got to keep in mind those diverse functions and the function of this commission and what we should do is make recommendations on, on what pertain to us and nobody, nobody sitting here as a prosecutor would object to anything that helps in the identification and location and presentation of the truth. Thank you. Good summation, Councilor. <laughs> Not as good as the one I gave, which will be on TV on April the 24th <laughs> for 2020. And I know it's a Friday night, but we all have Vivo. If you'd like to be watched, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> What's that? What's that? 20, April 24th. What is it? What is it? Uh, a murder case I just finished. <laughs> Anybody else have any comments? Yes, Harvey? I just want to say that, I mean, all of our lab directors haven't thoroughly probably read the whole thing yet. Uh, it just recently came out, but we had a lively discussion about it at our meeting just concluded, too. And the laboratories directors do agree with a lot of the stuff in there. We do realize that we don't have the resources needed to do some of the scientific research that needs to be done for some of these things. And we welcome that because we know it's needed within our science also. Um, there, are, there isn't enough resources for the laboratories or personnel to do some of those things or to, to do what we need to do. Um, we do disagree a little bit with the uh, I guess you say the tone of it, and that it's inferring that uh, all the crime laboratories in, in the United States are putting out junk science and stuff like that, and it does have that tone to it. And especially the New York State labs take uh, offense at that because 
we feel that because of a lot of things this commission and NICLAC is actually doing, that we are doing a lot of things we're supposed to be doing, and, and we are covering a lot of these things. What we're going to be doing over this next year, anyway, is we're going to be looking at the report, going over it, and we're going to be looking at what we can do in New York State to address some of those things within the resources that we have currently. There are things like a, like a certification that we can encourage our uh, staff to become uh, certified. Um, we can look at uh, maybe doing some different studies to look at uh, error rates within, within what we're doing too. So we hope to be looking at this whole report and seeing what we can do uh, right away and what we could do over the long term to try and address some of the issues within that. So, uh, I didn't want anyone to think that the lab, prime lab directors were looking at this and throwing it out the window saying it's, it's no good. We, we agree that a lot of it in there is, is very good and, and is appropriate. I think we probably could roll this discussion in a way. Uh, I know Bill uh, Fitzpatrick addressed some of the issues in the Bar Association's report, but um, that had made different had a, a different focus in terms of the wrongfully convicted and what procedures are in place that um, lead to wrongful convictions. Uh, but it does follow on, I think, our discussion of, um, of, the, um, of, of the NAS report. Um, so uh, we also have uh, materials. I'm sure everyone's had a copy of, of the wrongful conviction report of the New York State Bar Association as well. Uh, but I wanted to open that up uh, for discussion also. Uh, again, we don't have a whole lot of time, um, so this won't be the first and last time, but, but it is extremely timely, and there are a number of recommendations that were made in the report that does affect the commission. Um, so um, I don't know if anyone wants to talk about the, the report we want to get into it at our next meeting, but it's on the agenda for right now. Right. I, when you step out for just a second, I address those. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. With respect to uh, just the fingerprints, but I think the recommendations in the report have to do with expanding the jurisdiction of this commission so that we can cover uh, fingerprints that are done, fingerprint analysis done outside uh, the crime lab itself. Uh, evaluation of arson uh, analysis that's done outside the crime lab, and also uh, ballistic analysis done outside the crime lab. And I, I, some of that may be changing just by the fact that uh, uh, I think in ballistics a lot of it is already being moved into the crime labs. But I think those would be good ideas. It, it, if you don't mind, I'd like to address what my friend Bill said, because I, I'm encouraged. I think that uh, uh, there's more agreement here uh, uh, you know, first, please don't judge this report by uh, uh, the leaks, which uh, admittedly are not congruent with what's actually in here, uh, and, and uh, the tone, okay, or even the fact that there is only a former prosecutor <laughs> on the commission. Uh, what, uh, and as I heard you, Bill, the, the only, the, the, I think you were, pretty much supporting all the recommendations except for the notion of having a National Institute of Forensic Science uh, itself. And I, I would urge you to think about that again, uh, because what it's really uh, designed, I think what the ultimate legislation would be designed to do is, is to increase the resources to the forensic community so people can get accreditation, certification. And incidentally, with respect to certification, when you look at uh, how this report is written, uh, we are anticipating uh, ways to get rid of these quack experts. I mean, that's a big problem. Uh, you know, if, if you have a, a real program of certification, that means somebody that is not associated with the crime lab, uh, who is nonetheless coming in as an expert, uh, if they don't have a real certification when there is such a certification program available, um, then courts uh, may very well. Uh, not admit their testimony, certainly it's going to be a point of impeachment. And they should, I mean, literally what this commission, this report is saying, that uh, you shouldn't be testifying in the United States unless you're appropriately certified. Is it, who's, who's your guy in California? Ed Blake, is it? You know what? 
Don't, don't mention him. Don't, no, I mean, the problem with Ed Blake is that, that nobody has urged him more than Peter and I to get accredited. Right. And, and, he he never, a, and he never will. He's a maverick. He is... Uh, but you could, could, you could, is, could you envision a court in New York State precluding him from testifying and not being reversed? I, I, it's happened in places. I mean, uh, uh, that's a peculiar case. I'd be glad to call that some other time. But it's a pretty good example. There's somebody that, uh, uh, you know, it's a sort of a iconoclastic, <clears throat> libertarian, you know, kind of Ron Paul disciple that doesn't believe in organizations or, you know, any of the bureaucracy. And he's wrong about that. And he'd be the first to tell you that. It doesn't mean he isn't a great scientist. He is. And a, and a pioneer in this whole area of DNA. Uh, now, I know that there's a, a, a feeling, well, these guys are, you know, they're all from universities and they're all, you know, academics and they just want money to go to academia. Uh, and I'm not sure that's uh, uh, entirely fair in terms of even who was on the commission. For example, Bob Shaler was one of the leading members and a great supporter of his recommendations. And we all know Bob. Uh, and, and admire his work, and he is, you know, as practical and that trip as they come. And in terms of getting things done, or even a Pete Marone uh, from the Virginia Crime Lab, or uh, 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 Mr. Siegel, who's also another prominent criminalist, will support the recommendations here. Um, and what this report points out, which is really worth uh, thinking about, is that it says, yes, DNA is the most reliable of the forensic disciplines and has a database. And what they point out is it, it does come out of the broader scientific community. It started off in research, in medical uh, applications, and then it was transferred to forensics. And as a matter of fact, I know it's kind of a talking point, but I'm going to have to yell at my friend Jim Woolley about this. The 1992 NRC report uh, with respect to uh, DNA had a lot to do with making sure that it was admissible in all the courts, because that report... Well, in, in 92, it was already being admitted in some courts. Well, it was being and knocked out. They, being wanted, knocked they out. wanted it stopped no, it didn't until it was further studied. I've got no, the no, report. No, no. Believe me, it did It, 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 it talked about that. the specific recommendations that report told, called for certain kinds of validation studies, called for population genetics, uh, 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 research to be done. There was a second report, just to a disagreement about the numbers, but in terms of uh, setting up the quality assurance programs and the regulations for the DNA laboratories. Everything in that 1992 report has been adopted. It became the foundation of the DAV. I would have preferred that it not be with the FBI, that it had been an independent entity. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, that report had a lot to do with making sure that this stuff was admissible. This was being knocked out in lots of different courts on uh, a number of different levels when it shouldn't have been. Uh, and what we needed was to have uh, uniformity. I mean, we have CODIS now, right, in part because we're able to get this uniformity in the technology, uh, but we don't have that interoperability with APHIS, and, and that's insane. Uh, that's insane. And that re the report, you're, you're not going to get these kinds of good <laughs> national systems in place, and you're not going to get the quality right. of science you don't that need, you, you want. You don't need another bureaucracy to do that. You could do that without an, an, an independent bureaucracy that eventually is going to say, we're going to roll. We're going to control forensic science labs in the, in the United States. Well, it, it shouldn't be another big bureaucracy. Uh, we all agree with that. What it ought to be, uh, and I think that there's a lot of support from this among a lot of crime lab directors. What it ought to be is the federal entity that sends out more money because they're the only ones that have this kind of resources to do the additional research and to provide the resources to the state and localities so they really can take advantage of the accreditation and certification by the bodies that we've been using, right? So, in other words, we all would like to have uh, people within the crime webs in New York certified and have the appropriate access to training. Well, if you're going to require that, you've got to pay for it, right? And there has to be federal resources to do it. So I would contemplate legislation from Congress that would set this entity up but it also would be able to do a needs assessment nationally. In other words, it would be able to say, well, New York, you have backlogs, you have problems in certification, you have that in all these other states. The amount of money that the federal government has to give in order to raise a level of practice is X. All right? And we don't have that now. 
and I think that that shortchanges uh, the whole forensic community. That's why I think that our friends at the CFSO, which is, uh, many of you know, the, uh, uh, the lobbying group, and people at the American Academy of Sciences uh, are expressing some support for this concept because they see that we'll get the money that way. Okay, I do want to, yes. Look, the, the, the discussion and, and moving to the Bar Association support report, uh, I would just like to make a motion that we, we table this report. We've been here for three hours and change, and I can't think another moment, quite frankly, <laughs> and I don't think we can. So I'd like to make a motion to adjourn and just pick up this discussion, uh, especially about the Bar Association report at, at our next meeting. Well, Murphy's only been here two hours. <laughs> 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 I'll see you it's a long myself. meeting. Uh, I, I, is there, before we, we do that, um, there is mention that our next meeting is June 4th of 2009. Um, I know we do have a report uh, put out by the Innocence Project about investigating forensic problems in the United States. And now I think there is a little mention of the um, IG in New York, and Chris Hammond is, was the IG at the time. So I think um, maybe there was at least a recognition of the professionalism exercised uh, by Chris when Did she was IG in the report. Um, I don't know. In, in, no, you called it. You called it. You called it seeming, seemingly, seemingly sufficient. sufficient. And, Which, and you know, when I go home and you know my wife says, "How was dinner, honey?" I go, "Well, it was seemingly <laughs> <laughs> not really excited." So although we were prominently, although we were prominently featured in this report, I do want to commend this commission um, for being at the lead on many of these issues, and I'm sure, um, hopefully, will be included in the next report. Um, but there are a lot of um, very important findings in this report as well. Um, so I appreciate you bringing it and distributing it um, to the commission. And is there any um, second to the superintendent's oh, uh, motion? I just a yes. question. Is the commission okay. going, going to eventually come up with a statement regarding the NAS report? Well, I think that's tabled, and we'll um, discuss it at our next meeting. Oh, okay. Second. Okay. <laughs> Any opposition? Okay. Um, we stand adjourned. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs>